thank you for taking time to join that important observance. The theme of Congress 2021 is Northern relations. And in many ways, this event exemplifies the spirit of that focus, bringing Northern people and Northern voices to center stage in order to focus the attention of Canadians on pressing issues in the North. Over the past five years, it has been an honor and a real pleasure to meet, work alongside and build new or stronger relations with the Indigenous and non-Indigenous Northerners who have, been such a wonder, who have been such wonderful partners in imagining and making real this gathering. But of course, we're also here to celebrate all that the North and its people have to offer and who better to lead us in that endeavor than my friendly and dynamic neighbor, Richard Van Camp. Richard, as you already know, is a proud Klechon Dene from Fort Smith Northwest Territories. He's an internationally renowned storyteller and best-selling author. His novel, The Lesser Blessed, is now a movie with first-generation films and premiered in September of 2012 at the Toronto International Film Festival. He is the author of five collections of short stories, six baby books, three children's books, five comics, and much more. He's a wonderful, wonderful human being, and I feel blessed uh, to know him. And I'm very honored to introduce Richard to you now uh, to carry this session forward. Richard, over to you. Masi cho, Michael. Masi cho, sagya masi, dante, donate, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, Michael. It's a pleasure to be your neighbor. It's always a joy to see you and your Nichi Moose walking by hand in hand on another one of your walks celebrating your Pamatsuin, which is Cree for your happy life. So my friends, my relations, my heroes, it is such a pleasure to be here today. I raise my hands to you with utmost respect. I'm sorry about my hair. We're in a pandemic. I haven't been to see my, my hair guy in what, five months it looks like. Look, I'm a silver tip, my goodness. I uh, really am honored to be here today as the MC and the host for a celebration of Northern authors. We have Catherine Lafferty, Katmia, uh, friend and hero. We have Tanya Roach, again, friend and hero. We've shared the stage many times. Uh, Catherine, you and I have only shared the stage not enough times. I need to see you rock out, and I look forward to seeing you all rock out in the future as we celebrate all your new books. And Mr. Antoine Mountain, M Antoine, I've been reading you for 30 years. I've got a little presentation I'm going to make about the birth of Northern literature. So I'm so happy to finally share the stage with you uh, virtually, uh, thanks to Congress. And uh, we are awaiting our dear friend, Mr. Dennis Allen. I've been watching Dennis's movies. I've been reading his short stories. I've been reading his commentaries in newspapers and virtually for probably 30 years as well. So uh, I really wanna thank you all for, for joining us today. This is obviously an overwhelming time, a confusing time, an enraging time for many of us. And I just, uh, I'm so grateful you've made time to join us today as we celebrate the good things that are happening in Northern literature and of course in Indigenous literature. So if I could just take a few moments, I wanted to uh, observe protocol as the MC. I am from Treaty 8 country and we live here in Treaty 6 country in Edmonton, Alberta. And I wanted to do a land acknowledgement, please. This is the University of Alberta's land acknowledgement. It goes, the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and the Métis Nation homeland, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. I would also like to read the virtual land acknowledgement. I'd also like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet here on a virtual platform, we should take a moment to recognize the importance of the land on which we are located. We acknowledge the territory to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in building positive relationships between nations, and in developing a deep understanding of indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unprecedented territory of all Inuit, First Nations, 
and Métis peoples. My friends, Dante, Dante, Sagamasi, thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna have a lot of fun today. Um, I am just so happy to have my friends and heroes here. I wanna read their biographies, uh, but before I do that, I know I'm, I, I'm gonna save the best for last. I just wanted to give you a little slideshow of some of the books that I've had the pleasure of collecting from all our bookshelves here across the house. You know, if you're joining us as somebody who is new to Northern literature, I was on the phone recently with Judith Drinnen, who owns the Yellowknife Bookseller. Judith Drinnen has been running that bookseller, the, the biggest independent bookstore in the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife for 40 years. 40 years. She's so actually year 41. So she said 41 years ago when she moved to Yellowknife, Northern literature was written by a lot of people who weren't Northerners, some of whom weren't even on Canadian soil, some of whom had only visited the North a few times and uh, had written these books about him. She has had the joy of for 40 years expanding her Northern uh, section. Uh, when you go into the Yellowknife bookseller, um, she has the greatest collection of, I think, world Indigenous literature and Northern literature. So some of the books that we're going to be talking about, I'll be showing you. If you want them, order them from Judith Drinnen at the Yellowknife Bookseller. She's on Facebook. She's easy to get a hold of. And uh, she's a dear friend. Uh, she sells uh, Catherine's books. Um, she will soon be selling Tanya's books. She sells Antoine's books. And she'll soon be selling Dennis Allen's books. And uh, so some of the books I just wanted to just really quickly, uh, I got to just tell you, I'm a Virgo, I'm loud, I'm proud. A, a book that I love so much is We Remember the Coming of the White Man. And this is the book that's just come out. There's a special edition with a DVD at the back. And you can look up the authors because there's a few of them on here. Uh, there's Raymond Yakalaya, Sarah Stewart. Uh, but there's really, I think, a hundred elders from across the Northwest Territories. This is a celebration of oral literature and the oral tradition. So uh, they interviewed elders who had survived the TB and influenza epidemics. Uh, they had survived uh, so many things and uh, lived to talk about it. And so this is uh, the new edition. It's called We Remember the Coming of the White Man. I hope you buy it. I hope you read it. It is a treasure. Another really beautiful book is The Man Who Lived with a Giant, stories from Johnny Nayeli, who is a Dene elder. It's a really great book. Um, doing things the right way. If you love nonfiction, very scholarly, you have to be very smart to understand it. I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I've got my grade 12. I, I don't, there's not a lot going on here at any given time. I tried to understand this book. It's brilliant, but I, it's just, you know, I, give, me, give me fiction and I'm all yours. Anyways, great book. Everybody loves it. Everybody who's smart loves it. You're all smart. You'll do just fine. Um, one of our trail breakers, of course, was Mr. George Blondin. This is his book, Yamaraya. He talks about the lawmakers, the brothers, Yamoria and Yamaja, who gave us our Dene laws to this day. Uh, Mr. George Blondin, so many of us wouldn't be here as writers had it not been for Mr. Blondin and his incredible legacy. Of course, we have Mr. Antoine Mountain who'll be coming up. This book is a treasure. It is a garden of knowledge. I'm really happy to, I can't wait to hear what Antoine is going to share with us. If you love horror, if you love scary, if you, if you got past Hereditary, the movie, and, and started to believe in the world again, if you, could, if you can get past the movie Hereditary, you're going to do just fine with Taktumi, which means darkness in Inuktitut. And this is really a dangerous collection of short stories because it's ruthless and it takes no prisoners and they break a lot of laws that you shouldn't be breaking. And it's, it's just, it's haunted me. I wake up screaming because of this anthology and I've got a little story in there. It's kind of scary, but I thought it was my, you know, I did my best to scare people. And then I read what everybody else wrote. And you know, it's like, it's like you're having lunch with mother Teresa with me, you know what I mean? But everybody else is scary. And they're working on tack to me. Uh, sorry, not tack to me. <laughs> yeah, there, they're working on tack to me right now, volume two. And, Tanya Roach, you better have something in here in volume two, because you tell scary stories, okay? Okay. Uh, contemporary Northern stories uh, that were published in an anthology. This is called Coming Home. And this was, uh, I was part of this selection committee. This is Stories from the Northwest Territories. These are beautiful short stories. And uh, I hope you buy this. It's great. Katlia, her beautiful new book. Katlia, are you going to be reading from this book? 
Well, she's not. Okay. Well, okay. You know what? Just buy this book. Okay, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Porcupines and China Dolls by our friend, the late and great Mr. Robert Arthur Alexi. Uh, Robert attended Grolier Hall, and my book came out in 96, The Lesser Blessed. His book came out a few years later. And this was the book that really blew the roof off of the secrecy behind how violent and brutal um, Anuvik's Grolier Hall residential school was. And I was so proud of him. I thanked him so many times for writing this. Um, I know it divided many communities um, because he really betrayed the silence that uh, the church has had upon the Northwest Territories. I'm really proud of him. And if you're trying to grapple with how was it possible that 100,000 kids were taken, stolen from their families, how was that possible? And, and what was the fallout? This is the book. This is a good jumping point to read along with Antoine's book as well. You know, for many of us, Northern literature really began on Bush radio, CBC radio, and it began in the newspapers. When you think about News North, Up Here magazine, the Press Independent, Up Here magazine, Above and Beyond, that was really the first time I read Antoine Mountain. He had a, a syndicated um, uh, article where he was allowed to talk about whatever he wanted. Antoine was writing 30 years ago. George Blondin was writing 30 years ago. Cease Macaulay was writing years ago out of Anuvik. Uh, you look at um, my uncle, Johnny Washi was writing as well. And you think about the Slave River Journal and a lot of the Métis publications. That's really where Northern literature was born. And I hope one day somebody starts to collect all these thousands of articles written by our trailbreakers. And then we were so lucky to have um, uh, Joan Ryan uh, and Bren Colson. Bren Colson came out with The Myth of the Barren Lands. And since these trail breaking books have come out, there have been probably three or four generations of Northern writers who are publishing with, with larger publishers, many of whom have agents now. Um, it's a really an exciting time because you, you're never quite sure who's going to do what next. And I'm finding that Northern literature for so long other people have been telling our stories. And what we're seeing now is that it's our time to tell our own stories. And I'm gonna end before I do the big introduction with our writers, another um, really difficult book that I want to talk about really quickly is this graphic novel called Paying the Land by Joe Sacco. Uh, Joe came up, he's a award-winning cartoon journalist and he really exposed how complicated Den and Day the Western Arctic is right now with industry and organized religion. And if you want to see the fallout of what industry, big industry has done to the Northwest Territories and, and what residential schools have done to the Northwest Territories, this is essential reading. It is a really difficult book to read, but what Joe did was he interviewed a lot of Northerners that we all know and respect, and he gave them a, a platform to share their stories. And uh, it is difficult, it is tough. There are a lot of triggers in here, so be warned. But again, if you want some information on how the Northwest Territories is doing uh, from a journalist's point of view, I think that this is a great place to begin courageous conversations. Of course, nothing beats going to the source. I just wanted to put that out there. And I wanted to share some, something really beautiful. A couple of years ago, I was asked by Scott Willoughby to go out and find one clean chant short story for children and families that the world might lose if we didn't turn it into a children's book. And I had the joy of traveling to Bechico and Edzo and interviewing a pile of, of clean chant elders. And this is a new book that's just come out by Joe Lazar Zo from Gamaty. He is in his 70s, it's his first book. It's in English, it's in Clinchon. It was translated by his niece who used to babysit me when I was two years old. That's how small the Northwest Territories is. Uh, we're so proud of it. And it's called How Frog Brought Winter and Judith Jernin has uh, copies to sell. So really what my point is, is that it doesn't matter what stage of the game you're at in terms of, of as a reader or as a writer or as a storyteller. It just seems to me that right now, the most exciting literature for me is actually Northern literature. And I'm really proud to be here as an author, but most importantly, I am a huge fan of Kathleen, Catherine Lafferty, Tanya Roach, Antoine Mountain, 
and I'm so glad we get to share this celebration of Northern authors together. So I'm gonna read the biographies and then we're gonna do readings in the following order. We're gonna have Tanya Roach, and then we're gonna do Mr. Antoine Mountain, and then we're gonna do Katvia, uh, Catherine Lafferty. So Tanya Roach is a writer and Inuit throat singer living in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. She has written for literary magazines, judged the 2018 CBC short story contest, and she's been a cultural advisor for a documentary series on CBC. Tanya, you're gonna be first. Number two, Mr. Antoine Mountain. Antoine is Dene, North American First Nations, originally from, now Antoine, you're gonna drop kick me. I, I don't know how to say Fort Good Hope. If you could help us later, that would be great. Uncle, please, Masi Cho, okay. Uh, he's from Fort Good Hope in Canada's Northwest Territories. Born to a very artistic family, he grew up around their crafts, sculpting, beading, sewing, and even quill work. Later, he forged his own visual practice through painting, attending art school in Toronto, and learning abroad in Florence, Italy. He is the author for, of From Bear Rock Mountain, The Life and Times of a Dene Residential School Survivor. Hoka! Next up, we have after Mr. Antoine Mountain Reads, we're going to have Katlia. Katlia Lafferty is a trailblazing female Northern Dene novelist who specializes in intellectual property law with a focus on literary copyright to mitigate ongoing colonial cultural appropriation and Indigenous victimization in storytelling narratives. Her memoir, Northern Wildflower, published in 2018 and was a top selling book in the Northwest Territories upon release, and it's being used as a teaching tool in both secondary and secondary in Indigenous studies across Turtle Island. So that's both secondary and post-secondary Indigenous studies across Turtle Island. Her recently released fictional novel, Land, Water, Sky, was added to the CBC's fall 2020 reading list, along with being placed on the Scotiabank Giller Prize Craving Panlet List. Masi Cho, everybody. I'm so excited for what we're about to experience together. I see Mr. Dennis Allen has logged on. Dennis, welcome. Good to see you, cousin. I'm going to read Dennis's uh, biography here. Dennis, lovely to see you. It looks like the sun is shining where you are. Dennis Allen, ladies and gentlemen, is an award-winning filmmaker, accomplished writer, recording artist, and hopeless storyteller. I don't know what that means. You always make me laugh. Winner, he's the winner of the Alanis Abomsawin Best Documentary Award, the Sally M. Manning Award for Creative Nonfiction, and an honorable mention in American Songwriter Competition. Dennis Allen takes the art of storytelling to another level. I completely agree. Born and raised in Inuvik NWT, Dennis apprenticed under his Inuvialuit father and Gwich'in mother. He carries on a tradition which is steeped in his culture. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Let's have a good time, Masi Cho. Here we go. Tanya Roach, are you ready to take us away and give us a reading? Yes, I am. Okay. Thanks for all getting us all, all pumped up. <laughs> uh, Masi Cho, take us away. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya Marie Ekok Nivyatchiak. I live in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, which is Treaty 8 territory. Uh, Chief Draghi's territory where I've lived for the past 25 years. I am uh, a writer, uh, Inuit throat singer, a mother, and librarian assistant with the city of Yellowknife. I have written for the past 10 years for various magazine publications and provide Inuit cultural consultation for TV and media companies in Yellowknife and Southern Canada. Uh, I've written since I've learned how to write my own name in days of the week. Uh, growing up in Rankin and Let Nunavut and Yellowknife, these are two territories deeply immersed in the cycles of nature. Uh, I think what makes us unique compared to other parts of, the, of Canada is that the environment has a larger and stronger presence and voice. Uh, it's challenging logistically since we're so far from other metropolitan cities, uh, but we also have closer access to traditional Indigenous culture, tradition, and language. Um, up here, 
summer lasts about two or three months and winter lasts five or six. So it's not uncommon in the middle of winter for the power to go out several times a month. Um, in downtown Yellowknife, uh, it's not unusual for uh, it to go to a standstill because the power and internet have gone out. Uh, there have been times where us staff at the Yellowknife Public Library sit between bookshelves with an iPhone sitting under <laughs> under an emergency light, you know, because that's just uh, what happens a lot up here. Um, and so there was one night last winter when the power went out when I was at home and I couldn't find my iPhone. And it was really scary because I... Uh, I didn't prepare any candles or flashlights or anything like that, um, which I should have. I think every Northerner should uh, get used to doing stuff like that. Uh, but it was a, a very humbling experience because the following day, I tried to understand what the, the fear that I felt was trying to tell me. Um, and so I, I thought about how my grandparents and Inuit ancestors maintained light during winter months where the sun doesn't rise um, for three months or so in certain parts of the Arctic. Um, and so light was maintained traditionally uh, using a stone lamp um, with cotton dipped in seal oil. It's called a gulik. Um, and it was a woman's job to tend to this small flame 24 seven. So I tried to envision having the ability to face complete and total darkness and not feel afraid, just like my grandmother and all my relatives before. And it was very challenging and it wasn't easy and it still isn't easy. Um, but when you live in an area of the world where winter and darkness are present for the majority of the year. Um, I think learning how to handle fear and darkness uh, and cultivating a sense of safety when you're alone is very important. Um, and it's actually one, uh, learning how to handle fear is one lesson in traditional Inuit child rearing. Um, so I wrote a short story based on finding light in darkness. Uh, using inspiration from film imagery provided by the National Film Board. Um, they filmed traditional Netsilik families um, who live in the Qitikmut region of Nunavut. So these communities include Uqsuqduk or Joe Haven um, and Kuguruk, which is also known as Peli Bay. Um, the National Film Board filmed families who still lived nomadically um, into the middle of the 1960s. So the window uh, between total independence to colonization is very short. Um, so in writing stories, um, I'm a lot more intentional in searching for strength and health-based stories to interrupt the toxic dialogue I was fed as a kid that grew up in foster care and to illustrate the inherent wealth of knowledge that is applicable uh, both in the past and the present. Um, so after uh, getting really scared one night, this, uh, this story came to me. So I'll just read a bit of that. Um, and so the scene is, um, there's a new married couple living in an igloo or a snow house, uh, and it's the middle of winter um, and everyone is asleep. It's gonna take a quick drink. You can all hear me good, right? It was the middle of winter and the sun would not rise for two more full moons. A baby was born during a night that had lasted weeks. He would not know the warmth and glow of sunlight just yet. To him, the only and brightest light in the universe was a small flickering flame on a stone lamp, bright enough to keep his family warm. Darkness is not frightening when the hands of those you love are near. 
The baby cupped his mother's breasts with both hands as milk poured out warm and sweet. Her chest was a cave. It was a den. It was an earth of its own. A heartbeat soft and consistently like a hum. Lulling the child to sleep as it had months ago when they shared the same body. The baby was an extension of the woman, but with its own hands and feet. They were a body of love so deep and so old. It was the same thread that wove him to his mother and his father and his grandparents and so on. They were a web of lives that all breathed the same cold Arctic air. As a grandparent gasped for their last breath, a baby would breathe their first. They were and are the same wave of breath that would live as long as the wind blew. Um, and so the new dad, his name is Solomon, uh, just for reference. Solomon's brown back faced the entrance of the igloo, shielding mother and baby from the lingering breeze. The cold seemed to be its own living thing, though after his years of hunting, he could not tell if it was ruthless or caring in the warmth that it sheltered and took. The cold built and destroyed. It kept snow houses intact and took the lives of sled dogs in the deep of night. It was a force that supported and dismantled life unpredictably. While he dreamt of white animals, the cold would numb his back into a dull ache. This was an ache that he actually craved for. His body heat and grits was larger than his own body. As his family slept warm beneath the animal skins, one hand reached for icy snow to cool him. The cold would hurt no more than the sharp pricks of wind that bit his face when he rode with his dog team on a winter day. To him, pain was a matter of perspective and the cold did not hurt. In his dream, he saw a bear and possessed the tenacity to face this beast with nothing but a spear and might. This dream would come true in weeks to come. He would survive and provide meat for his families and the rest of the village. Though in the bear's eye, he recognized a similar taste of ruthlessness, of self-indulgence only momentarily. It was the same singularity present in many male species with the ability to get up and leave after conception without an ounce of obligation. I guess humanness taught him the value and necessity of staying, of building a legacy of his own. The baby was his own body of bones that would grow to know the dance of life and hunting, of stalking and praying with humility. Ego and pride in hunting ventures was a subtle temptation that would bear fruitless rewards in the future, endangering his family and his people. As this small family curled between layers of caribou fur, snow fell gently outside their igloo. With each flake and fraction of white falling from above, they would not see how mother nature cleaned and restored humanity, even in com complete darkness. The worries and apprehensions the new parents felt would be whisked away while they slept on the same winds that swept human airs away. Nature would forgive and provide for humanity unfailingly. Just as the woman nursed her baby and softened her husband edges with the valleys and hills of her own body. As long as snow falls and the Arctic stays cold, nature will be kind. That is my story. Masi Cho, Tanya. Masi Cho, thank you so much, Tanya. Boy, I missed hearing you read. Thanks, yeah, we've man. shared the stage several times at the Northwoods Writers Festival. I've shared the stage with Katria, Dennis Allen, Antoine at the Northwoods Writers Festival in Yellowknife. And by the way, if you want more Northern literature, the next Northwoods Writers Festival will be online and in person. But if you can't make it in person, a lot of it's going to be virtual. 
just check out Northwards Writers Festival online. You can Google it. Uh, the dates are June 10th to June 13th. And I'm going to be joining in to hear exactly this. More Northern Voices. Okay, next up, we have Mr. Antoine Mountain. Antoine, welcome. Masi Cho, and thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to mention a few things here before I start reading from my book. Is uh, I'm glad to see young uh, writers uh, coming up to represent themselves and re representing their their people, and as we just heard from. Tanya in a very skillful and knowledgeable way. It's very difficult to do anything like that that involves people. It uh, sort of indicates uh, wh where you're really coming from. And uh, Richard, you were mentioning my hometown and traditional name is uh, Radelincon. It simply means uh, town by the rapids. There's actually two rapids up the river, Sansu Rapids and then uh, Ramparts Rapids. And then as I, as I mentioned that too, I, when I saw uh, Dennis Allen's name connected to this event, for some reason that made me really feel happy. The last few days being in isolation, you know, your, your thoughts go to certain uh, uh, things that took place before. And I know that uh, Dennis made a film of uh, the way our people would uh, come all the way from the barren lands uh, towards Kapo Mitwe at Koval Lake and then to Fort Good Hope. There's one particular scene in there that had to do with my late brother-in-law, Fred uh, China. And uh, Dennis was doing the narration on this film about uh, feeling ambivalent about being so close to a person that had lost someone right at that very site that was uh, being filmed. And even though uh, at, at times we, we don't know what we're really doing here, but what it is is we, we are representing the voice of our people Somebody has to, you know, somebody has to take that first step. So I'm really glad that's happening right at this time. And uh, some of those dangers maybe that Tanya was referring to, it, it also comes up in different uh, situations, not only on the land. For myself, even though I attended a total of uh, 12 years at three different uh, residential schools, I voluntarily uh, added another five years to uh, present this uh, book to the world. And it, it's so complicated that uh, it, uh, we went through eight different editors just to get it in, right into context and all that. So I know that each one of you are putting whatever your best efforts forward to present the, the, the voice of our people. So I will just go ahead and uh, I, I spoke with Michael beforehand and we picked out a couple of uh, the shorter uh, chapters uh, for me to, to read here today. The first one is called The Procession of Carriages. In a bizarre scene of hopelessness and loss, prisoners in the Nazi death camp at Auschwitz watched as empty baby carriages looted from them made their way back to the train station, five in each row. It took an agonizingly, agonizingly suspended hour for the macabre procession 
of strollers to make their way to the platform to be sent where and for what purpose, no one could guess. Auschwitz, the, Nazi, the Nazis and the Final Solution by Lawrence Reese, creative director of history programs for the BBC, is a history of one of the concentration camps in Adolf Hitler's maniacal plan to exterminate all Jews. The book is dedicated to the 200,000 children killed in that place of human depravity. To his credit, Rees notes that these innocents, along with the 1.1 million, voices forever silenced at that one camp alone could never be a part of the testimony included. Much of this historical record comes from survivors of places like Auschwitz. With the child in mind, perhaps English poet, John Benjamin says it's best. Childhood is measured out by sounds and smells and sights before the dark hour of reason grows. John Bateman, summoned by bells. Meaning very likely that we each in our own way learn to act or not in those dark realities. In her psychological study, into that darkness, an examination of conscious, author and Holocaust scholar, Zita Sereni focuses on Teresa, wife of Franz Stengel, commander of the very same death camp alluded to by the Polish prisoner. Sereni quotes Stengel's wife confronting him I know what you are doing in Sobibor. My God, how can they? What are they doing in there? Teresa held out for several days, but eventually gave in to what the Nazis expected of their women, wives in particular, loyalty, submissiveness, and comfort. For our part, in the residential schools, the underlying fear we went through began long before we came along, as if we were born into the plans for hellfire and brimstone rot in the names, name of Jesus by the earliest Christian missionary zealots in our country. There were, of course, decent priests and nuns, but for the most part, they were given a program to follow and did with the idea of killing the Indian in us. Benjamin also reflected on what we have absorbed from the baptismal waters of these religious hypocrites. But most of us turn slow to see the figure hanging in the tree and stumble on and blindly grope, upheld by intermittent hope. God, grant before we, we die, we all may see the light as did St. Paul. John Bateman, the conversation of St. Paul the resultant cultural genocide served the same purpose as the plans to exterminate the Jews in Auschwitz, to forever silence the human heart. Only our possession of carriages went on for much longer. To adjust 
as undetermined destination, like little brown kites in the hands of future Mola children. We remain aloft, many mercifully let loose for the empty. Only the historical procession of carriages has its way of coming back around. This one idly pushed back into the market by a Hitler fan by the name of John J. Trump. Replace the Jews with Native Americans, Mexicans and Muslims, and it's all the same day, isn't it? The second one that uh, I picked out with uh, Michael is, uh, let's say less of an overall view, but more of a personal one. Each writer voluntarily or not has to go through this same process of looking within yourself to see what it is you have to say I grew up in the 60s and although we were aware that there was a lot of music, we were almost more eager to hear what it is. People like Bob Dylan like that, people that really had something to say. In the future, it could be that you presenters that are here today are going to be, going to be that part of history. We, we never know that part of it, but it happens, you know. This one is called Meeting Sahodayana Bear Spirit. I was taken way, way back beyond Mola time. Through the haze from the burning coals in the center of my first all night teepee ceremony, I could hear the medicine man's chant sending me back, back. He had told me that these last four songs would be from a place I was really from, a hunting camp, way up in the mountain, in my mountain home, thousands of years ago, before all of this came here. And Billy, Arizona, the bear medicine man of our Navajo Dene Nation, was right. That Sahodaina. Bear Clan spirit had me in its firm grip. Right from the start, just after the sun set the evening before, through the cedar man just to my right, he asked me what I was afraid of. I told him any kind of loud or sudden noises and that I wasn't sleeping proper. It turned out this Sahodaira had stalked me for the last few years for trying to harm it. Every little sound got me to jumping, even the sudden noise of my own making, living like a shadow, just waiting for that ax I didn't know to fall. The evening before though, I was rather worried about how the teepee for the prayer meeting of the Native American church would be filled at all. The teepee usually held up to 30. I was new to this part of the United States, the Southwest after all, and had come by myself some months before complaining about pain in my legs. But this elder brought everyone who needed to be there to help me out with a problem I had created with this bare nation. Something looking for me, something didn't know how to die, can't be outrun, but knew me all too well. 
When we finally got to the midnight water in the break, I went outside noticing the star so bright, the night air so brisk, familiar to the north, my distant home. For the first time ever, ever at the growing number of these meetings, I had learned to go to, I kind of staggered to one side and really threw all of that bitter peyote medicine all up through tears, remembering the words I'd been told. That bad feeling we have, you know, don't ever go away unless we do something about it. Something from our old time Indian ways, medicine ways, that bad stuff, it sits right there in the pit of your stomach, like a cancer, making you feel bad and do foolish, harmful things. Now, and just after I had heaved up all of that, all of them bitter years of pain and outright neglect, I felt a light cloud descend on the blessed night air, alighting its warming blanketed embrace and a nice soft cushion to walk on from here on in. The rest of the veterans of these spiritual ways in the teepee, they all knew this book. They all knew this look I now had and knew that everything would be okay for me from now on. And of course they were right. The elderly cedar man pointed out the new way the fire was now burning with a new life in lively colors, even blues and greens, lively sparks popping. Before it was smoldering and smoking, causing people to cover their mouths and noses. Through it, a gruff voice whispering, tired said, when that light shines off your soul, it leaves an echo like a shine long into lonesome days, a prism full of rainbows. in to the begging bowl of your life, reflected all around. And that's my wish for you. It took me a number of years more, but Sahodai in a bare spirit took pity on me and made it right for me to walk the good red road again. With that, I say Masi, thank you. Merci, Cho, Antoine. Bless you. Thank you, Uncle. I'm so grateful for your good words today. Merci. Next up, we have Katlia. Katlia, welcome. Merci, Cho. Take it away. Am I unmuted? Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Catherine. My Dene name is Kathleen. I'm from Samba K, Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. I was raised by my grandmother, Alice Lafferty, and my grandfather, Edward Lassard. I am currently living in Songhees Territory in Victoria, BC, I'm here going to school in my going into my third year of Indigenous law at UVic. And I'm thankful to be here today and thankful to be um, listening to some other great speakers and be amongst this group of talented people. So Masicho, um, I'm going to be reading from my third upcoming novel called This House Is Not A Home. And I thought it would be fitting to read an excerpt about the um, main character who was apprehended when he was young, when he was a young boy living out on the land um, by the missionaries. So his name is Ko and Ko in our language means it can mean two things. It can mean fire or it can mean home. And in this case, his name means home. Ko remembered clearly the day that he was taken. His father had gone out to check his trap line a few days before. It, went, it was one of the rare occasions that Ko didn't go with him. He needed to stay home and help his mom with some of the chores around the house as she wasn't feeling well. 
Ko's mother was inside preparing food. Ko was outside as always. He was sitting on a boulder curled over a small piece of wood that he was chiseling into one of his many carvings that improved with each piece of wood he dedicated to the craft. He had just finished carving out the eyes of an eagle when he saw something from the corner of his own eyes. Boats were slowly making their way through the communities on the peninsula, stopping along the shoreline where the houses stood. Ko could see that when the visitors got back into their canoe, there was a commotion followed by faint cries and people standing at the shoreline huddled together. He couldn't make out what they were saying, but he knew something wasn't right and ran to tell his mother. She followed him outside to see what was going on, but she stopped in the doorway of their house and leaned on the wooden frame for support holding her stomach. They both watched as the boats moved in closer their canoes slowly filling up with children who were dragged away from their parents as they tried to hold on to each other, not knowing why they were being torn apart. Ko's mother took him by the hand, hurried inside and shut the door. She continued about her business, preparing their next meal as she always did. When Ko tried to ask her what was happening, she didn't respond. Instead, she, try she tried to hide her sadness. She couldn't bear to surrender to what was happening. She didn't want to believe it. She closed her eyes, trying to keep her tears in and will the missionaries out, but she could hear their paddles cutting madly through the water as they came closer. She had gotten word some time ago that they might be headed north. Her sister had learned of the strange people from her husband's father who had gone as far as the flatlands to make trade. Their relatives in the south warned of a people dressed in costume who believed a man to be the creator of all things. She was told that they were taking the children away from their families, forcing them to believe their ways some never to return home. These people, she was warned, were not like them. They were from another part of the world. They were all black and tied long ropes around their waists with shining medallions hanging around their neck. Ko's mother could see now that the warnings were true, but it was too late to take Ko and run. Besides, she hadn't the strength. She was too weak with morning sickness that they wouldn't make it very far even if they tried. Like a swift summer sandstorm, the missionaries blew through the small indigenous communities that dotted along the shoreline of the peninsula and silenced the children's laughter. <coughs> it was early spring and there was still heaps of heavy slush in the shadows off the trails. The warmth of Ko's mother's breath evaporated in the air in front of her as she bravely put on her shawl and stepped outside. She watched in shock as the burly men in red suits and black boots beat the mothers and fathers with long thick batons when they tried to stop them from taking their children. Ko tried to see what was going on and as he peeked out from behind his mother, but she put her hand over his eyes and blocked his view as they approached his cousin Kiwiton's home. Although Kiwiton was fast and fit, the men in red suits outnumbered him. They chased him down and scooped him up by the stomach before he could get away. The Mounties hung on to both his arms tightly as the priest tried to put a blessing on him. The priest had held a heavy cross out in front of him, believing that there was an evil in the boy, but this only angered Kiwiton even more. He kicked and punched at the cloaked stranger who stood in front of him in patriarchy, his large black cloak churning in the changing winds. Ko's mother gripped her son's hand tightly and met him at eye level. Don't run, she whispered, and don't fight back. She, be she began to cry, telling him that he must be brave and wait for his father to bring him back home. Go with him now and wait. Your father will come for you. Be brave. She kissed him on the forehead before walking out in front of him into the blinding sunshine. With her head held high, she walked straight towards the fast approaching boats, their oars ripping maniacally through the water, breaking through the last of the thin ice on the shoreline, cracking it like pieces of delicate glass. The priest stood up in the rocking canoe with a large wooden cross in hand. He waited for the Mounties to dock the boat on the smooth, slippery rock before being helped out while the children inside the boat whimpered below him, except Kiwiton, the only one in the boat not crying. Ko's mother noticed right away how sickly the foreigner looked. The priest was pale and haunch. The sight of him up close made her ill and she couldn't hold in her overbearing nausea anymore. She tried to cover her mouth, but she bent over and brought up the berries she ate that morning. As she wiped her mouth clean with the back of her hand, she saw the disregard on the Mounties' faces as they looked down at her, disgusted at the sight of her. The nun sat still in their long canoe, next to the captive children, their hair covered in black cloth held tightly to their head. As the Mounties pushed past Ko's mother, she watched helplessly as they took Ko. Holding onto her stomach, she looked up and forced a smile, nodding gently to make sure he knew he was going to be okay, that she would be okay. She had hoped that upon his return, Ko's father would band together with the other men in the community and bring their children home. 
With the help of the Mounties, the priests collected the rest of the children out of every home on the peninsula. One by one, they were tossed into the large canoe until there was no room for more. As they headed out of the inlet, Kiwiton built up the courage to try to jump out of the boat, but he was pulled back in and shoved down. The Mounties had no patience for Kiwiton's relentless determination, and the priest gave a nod to the larger enforcer, giving him the go-ahead to apply more force. The Mountie punched the boy hard on his temple, knocking him out cold. Key Wheaton was left lying at the bottom of the boat, a solemn reminder for the rest of the children to behave until they would arrive in a new land that they had never seen. Ko tried to help his cousin, but he was hit hard across the hand with a strap by one of the disapproving nuns. <clears throat> Ko then set his eyes out on the lake behind him, trying desperately to remember his way home. It was the first time that he learned to numb his feelings for his own survival. Little did he know that when they arrived at their destination, Key Wheaton would be unable to wake up. He would later be buried behind the schoolyard in an unmarked grave. With his eyes wide, Ko never blinked once as he mapped the route in his mind so that he would know where they were going and more importantly, so he would know his way back home. Ko's mother broke down and wept when the boat turned the corner of the small in island and out of sight, off to a distant place that she could only hope he would return from unharmed. That very day, Ko's father was on his way home earlier than expected after a successful muskrat harvest. His dog team raced through the trails heading for home, but when he heard the sound of distant cries through the trees in the small communities that he passed by on his way, he slowed down to be sure of what he was hearing. Through the clearings, he saw weeping parents huddled at the shorelines, the sound of infants too young to be taken away to school mirroring the painful sobs in the sorrowful arms of their mothers. Ko's father sent his dogs into a sprint as he lashed his whip on the ground next to them. The bells tied to the end of his whip rang out as he headed towards home hoping that he wasn't too late to save his only son. Masicho Katlia for honoring the 100,000 kids that were taken, some of whom are with us right now. And thank you for honoring the ones who didn't make it home. Masicho, thank you. Next up, we have Mr. Dennis Allen. Dennis, welcome. Masicho for being here. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to uh, all the other uh, writers and thank you for your work. But I'll just introduce myself briefly here. My, I'm from Inuvik, Northwest Territories originally. And uh, my father's uh, Inuvialwit, but really they're Alaskan Eskimos that migrated before there was borders. So we have lots of connections in Alaska. And my mother is Vantad Kuchin from Okro, Yukon. And they were one of the first uh, couples to interracially marriage because before that we were sworn enemies. <laughs> so the times have changed. The church brought one good thing was peace. <laughs> but anyways, I grew up um, listening to stories my dad was a storyteller and we, I spent a lot of time, uh, as we say, in the bush, out on the trap line, like uh, uh, the other writers were talking about growing up on the land, we muskrat camp and goose camp, caribou camp, whale camp, all different seasons. And my dad would, and his friends would tell stories and that's kind of how I grew up. I apprenticed under my dad. And then in town, my mother would tell us stories about being raised by her grandfather, old chief Peter Moses, who was uh, chief of the Old Crow Indian people from 1936 to 1954. So that's kind of how I grew up. And um, I never really read when I was a kid. I just, we just learned how to tell stories and all the kids of my generation and my older siblings generation were all storytellers. We like, we like to tell stories. And so that's what I do. I tell stories and, and I, eventually I learned how to make films and uh, I became a filmmaker and I recorded uh, two albums of original music. And um, I have a website called Dennis Allen Entertainment if you want to check it out and I have all my work on there, but I'm going to read you uh, I, I haven't published any books, but I've published lots of stories and uh, I'm working on a collection of short stories based on the characters that I'm gonna read to you today. And uh, I just wanted to kind of give you a prelude to the story. In the North 
uh, we love our country and Western music because it kind of um, gives us uh, agency. The music that, uh, you know, they sing about poverty or prison or, or difficult times, hard times. George Jones, Hank Williams, um, Loretta Lynn sings about poverty. And that's kind of how people grew up. Uh, and that music kind of uh, gives us, uh, like I said, it gives us agency. It kind of validates our existence. And it's a spiritual experience to listen to country and Western music with a bunch of old timers. And just to see that the effect it has on them. And uh, so the story I'm, I'm going to read from, it's called The White Stetson Hat. And it's, uh, it, it's a, about um, the greatest Merle Haggard fan ever to come out of this fictional reserve that I write about. And uh, he finds out that he has cancer and he wants to see Merle Haggard before he dies. And just so happened that Merle Haggard's coming to Edmonton next spring. So the whole little community gets together and they raise enough money to send Luke and, and uh, my character and my, my sidekick kid by the name of Chubby. Just enough money for us, all of us to go down for us to take care of Luke on the way down to, to Edmonton to go see Merle Haggard. And so uh, I'm just picking up the story as we, as we hit the road here. Uh, so uh, one other thing is uh, actually two other things. This story uh, was shortlisted for the Writers Union of Canada. And I just got long listed for the CBC Short Story Prize. Uh, I didn't make it to the short list, but I'm quite happy to make it to the long list. And uh, another thing is I write in my character's vernacular, which is pidgin English. If you ever read W.P. Kinsella, who really took his cue from Edith Josie, who used to write a column called Here Are the News out of Okro Yukon, you'll understand uh, where my characters are coming from. So here we go. So we take off early in the morning just as the sun is rising above the Blue Mountains. Luke been getting radiation treatment for his cancer and he lose most of his hair. His body shrink, but his skin stay the same and he look old. How are you making out, Luke? I ask him as we bounce along the gravel road. Just keep us between the ditches, he say. He cough and hack a bit before he fall back asleep. To save money, me and Chubby bring along a siphon hose and we help ourselves to RCMP gas all the way down. That siphoning, it's called siphoning gas. For anybody who don't know that. We get into Edmonton and check into the Pan American Motel. There's only one single bed, so we fix it up good for Luke and me and Chubby curl up on the floor next to the heater. The next morning, I asked the old lady at the front desk for directions to the ticket office for Merle Hager tickets. You better get there early, she say. Every Indian within a thousand miles is going to be there. She draws a map, and sure enough, the lineup is around the corner. Jacob Bone's wife give us his old wheelchair just in case we need it. When people see Luke in the wheelchair, they tell us to go to the front of the line. We pay for our tickets with a shoebox full of $1 bills and a sock full of quarters. The next day, we bring Luke down to the pawn shops to look for the white Stetson cowboy hat, just like the one Merle Haggard uses. We find one at Alberta Pond right on 97th Street. Where are you boys from, the old man asks as he take the price tag off the hat. Rabbit skin reserve, I tell him, way up north. What, you brings, what brings you down this way, he say as he take a damp cloth and wipe the dust off the brim of the hat. We're going to see Merle Haggard, I tell him proudly. He take a long look at Luke in the wheelchair and his eyes get sad. He stop and put his head down like he's thinking of what to say. You boys go on and take the hat, he say as he hands it to us. Tell Merle Haggard, I said hello. We shake his hand and thank him, then walk out the door before he changes his mind. The next night we go to... That night, we go to Bruno's Steakhouse and order T-bone steaks and drink cold draft beer. Even though Luke's appetite is not like it used to be, it's hard for him not to eat all the good meat and chew on them fat bones. We buy a case of beer and a pack of cold cigars, cold cigars and park down by the river. We crack a beer and light up a colt and talk about how much fun we're going to have at Merle Haggard's concert. Luke is a few years older than us, and he tells us stories about being in jail and how Merle Haggard pulled him through many a lonely night. We sit there in Luke's truck and go through three eight-track tapes. Luke sing along to every song. 
old steamboat who owned the general store got a few old suits that he lent out for court funerals or weddings. Before we left, he lent us one he must have got from Porter Wagner's rummage sale because it got rhinestones on the collar and, and on the breast pockets and on the cuffs. Pretty doggone snazzy, Rufus Tallow tell Luke as Luke looked himself in the mirror. Yeah, not too bad, eh, Luke say as he looked sideways. Now all I need is Dolly Parton sitting on my lap. Even old Steamboat who can barely understand English have a good laugh. On the night of the concert, look, Luke put that coat on over a white shirt we borrowed from Levi Thunder, who's the Pentecostal minister on our, on our reserve, except on Saturday night when he get drunk by himself. He even give Luke a bolo tie that got a cross on it. I bring the wheelchair in from the back of the truck. No need for that, Luke say. I got enough in the tank for another night, he say as he grab his crotch and laugh. He take, um, he take a Mickey out from his boot and take a good stiff snort then put it back in. Luke snap his arms out so that white shirt show about half inch past his cuffs and he look really smart with his new cowboy hat and it's hard to tell he's sick. We sit close enough in, in the front. We sit close enough to the front for Merle Hager to, you, to hear Luke yell out, sing me back home, which he sing and dedicate to the man in the white Stetson hat. Luke stand during the whole song and sing along like he's on death row and only Merle Haggard can save him. Luke wave his white Stetson hat and whistle with just his lips like a real old time cowboy. Chubby been taking pictures the whole time with a Polaroid camera, Ida Scow lend us, and he got everybody in our row holding them pictures up till they develop. When the concert is over, we wait till everybody clear out so we don't have to get caught in the big rush. We walk through the empty parking lot toward Luke's truck, which is parked way in the back. I can die any now. I can die any day now, boys. Luke say as he take one last pull on his Mickey. I done seen the hag and that's good enough for me. He spin the cap back on the empty bottle and slam dunk it into the garbage bin. Just then a long white stretch limousine pass us on its way out. It go about 50 feet, then stop and back up. I got no outstanding charges in paying all my bills, so I wonder what they want. The back window roll down and there's a guy with a white cowboy hat and his eyes is hidden beneath it. That's a mighty fine looking hat, my friend, the guy say. Feel like making a trade? It's kind of a strange request and we don't know what to make of it. Then he take his hat off and stick it out the window. That's when we recognize him. It's Merle Haggard himself right there in front of us. We all jump back and look at one another. We don't know whether to blow bubbles or take a piss. Well, what do you figure, Merle Haggard asked Luke. Luke shake his head and stick his head in the window to make sure he's seeing what he's seeing. He snap up, holy shit, Merle Haggard. Damn right, he say. Like God just offered him another month to live. Then he hand Merle Haggard his hat and take Merle's. You think, I mean, can you... Uh, um? Chubby mumbled as he untangled the big clunky Polaroid camera from around his neck. Well, I'm just an okie from Muskoki, but sure, what the hell, Merle Haggard say as he step out of the limo. His driver take three polar Polaroids of me, Chubby, Luke, and Merle Haggard. Luke shake Merle's hand and tell him how his music keep him from hanging himself in jail in 1977. Merle bow his head for a moment and tell Luke he know, he know the feeling. He wish us all the best, then drive off. When we get back to our hotel, Luke let us try on the white Stetson hat. We pretend to be singing to 20,000 people. That night, that night, Luke sleep with a hat under his bed. When we get back to Rabbitskin Reserve, Luke is bedridden under doctor's orders and everybody visit him, some figure for the last time. The next weekend is Rabbitskin River Spring Jamboree and everybody is packed into Native Hall for the yearly talent show. Even though there's a lot of good singers, it don't feel right without Luke singing Merle Haggard songs. The MC announced one of Gideon Shoeshine's boys as the last performer. The lights is low and everybody is quiet to hear Gideon's boy play You Are My Sunshine on mouth organ. Just as he finished the back door open, everybody to turn to see who it is, but we can't make them out on account of the truck lights shining behind them. It looked like somebody cradling a little kid in his arms. When they walk in, Butchie Magnuson is carrying Luke, who's wearing Merle Haggard's white Stetson hat and pajamas. He's got a Mickey of whiskey in one hand and a guitar in the other. Everybody watching silence as they walk up to the stage. 
Butchie plopped Luke down in the chair and saying to the mic, we got one more injury. Hope you don't mind. Everybody kind of in shock to see Luke up there half dead and the other half drunk and wanting to sing. I hope you guys don't mind, but I got one more song in me, Luke half whisper as he repositioned the mic. And I figure I better get it out because it ain't doing me no good where I'm going. Luke take a pull on his Mickey and stick it back on by this chair. Then he strum a G chord. He hack and hiss for a few seconds, then croak out the first line of Merle Haggard, sing me back home. Howard McGinty, who run the board, turn up the mic so Luke's raspy half whisper fill the whole room. First, just a few people clap, then more join in. Then it become a thin, thunderous applause as everybody stand on their feet and give Luke Jackson, the greatest Merle Haggard singer to ever come out of Rabbit's Skin Reserve, all the love he need to make it to the end of the song. We're so loud that we can't even hear him singing. Everybody is half crying and half laughing as Luke belt out for the last time in his life his favorite song. We bury Luke with his hat in the same suit he used on the night of the concert. Even though Slob lend us a Slob Slobanovich who owns Slobanovich Enterprise, lend us a truck to bring Luke's casket to the graveyard. We decide we're gonna take turns carrying him there ourselves. Even Ida Scow, who have to lift her arm up real high on account of how short she is. As we're walking, somebody starts singing the first lines to the song, Sing Me Back Home. Even though hardly anybody can carry a tune, we all sing along anyway. So there you go. There's my story called The White Stetson Act. Oh, musty Cho, Dennis. You're Dennis, welcome. I can't thank you enough. I, I remember the first time you shared that story at Northwards. I think about it all the time. I can't think of a finer note to, to sign off on. But ladies and gentlemen, I really want to thank you all. Masi Cho, Sagya Masi, thank you. And please join me in giving a round of applause to Mr. Dennis Allen, Katlia Lafferty, Tanya Roach, Mr. Antoine Mountain, I can't thank you enough. Michael Driscoll, Musi Cho, Congress, thank you. My friends, take care of yourselves. These are very overwhelming times. Maybe after this, go out, go for a good walk. Maybe drop some tobacco, say a prayer. Uh, give your worries, give your sorrows to the fire, to the water, to the moon, to the sunrise. Do what you need to do and surround yourself with really good people. Eat good, sleep good, pick up the phone call a survivor, check in on them and say, how are you doing? You know, bring them food if you can. You know, I just, uh, my heart goes out to everybody really hurting right now. And uh, I really feel that this has been a gathering of four incredible Northern voices. I can't thank you enough for all the light you brought to my heart today. Uh, I'm so grateful. And I look forward to sharing the stage with you in the future. And most of all, I look forward to giving you all a big handshake and a hug when it's safe to do so. One day at a time, my friends, one day at a time. Now, folks, if you liked what you saw here, uh, join us for Northwards, which is an online Northern Writers Festival. The dates are June 10th to June 13th. All you have to do is enter Northwards Writers Festival Yellowknife. It'll take you to the website and you'll be able to see more Northern writers sharing their, their insight, their humor, their resilience, their strength, their prowess with storytelling and the written words. And I'm just so proud of all my friends here. Please know you are my heroes. I really needed this today. I think it's safe to say everybody else did too. So we're gonna sign off right now. I wanna be respectful of our, each other's time. Uh, it's a beautiful day. There's still some daylight, please go outside. And uh, my wife, Kiwi and our little boy, Adzazi, we're gonna drop some tobacco for all of you today. And of course, for all survivors, of uh, the residential school, the horrific residential school experience and uh, for all those who didn't make it home. So one day at a time, I look forward to seeing you all properly when it's safe to do so. Once again, again, Michael, thank you for setting such a wonderful tone today and uh, take care of yourselves. Okay, remember, we need you all healthy. We need you all strong. I can't wait to read what all of you are gonna publish next. Okay, see you, take care. Bye everybody. Masicho, thank you.